great with visuals, but cultural vandalism doesn't get too many plot holes. Doesn't get Superman. I ran with I ran Zack Snyder. It is I, the Worm's Hole, master of four disguises. That was my second disguise, the disembodied voice. You see, I have to come to you incognitus today because our topic of discussion, it's on the controversial side. Is this to say we're talking about the malfeasance of corporatized journalism or the sexual assault allegations leveled against Donald Trump and Joe Biden? No, silly. It's the other thing that got me banned from- I'm going to be defending Zack Snyder. <laughs> For those not up on the controversy, Zack Snyder has directed and, along with his wife Deborah Snyder, co-produced a number of big-budget blockbuster movies, and nobody's stopped him yet. Now, if you had asked me even a few years ago what I thought of Zack Snyder, I would have said, great with visuals, but before trailing off non-committally or turning that into a backhanded insult about his perceived shortcomings in other areas of filmmaking. But over the past few years, I find myself looking at his work with increasingly fresh eyes, and the more I do so, the more I become convinced that there's a lot more to him and his filmography than I initially believed. And today, we're going to talk about why. There are three movies of his in particular we're going to take a look at. I'll lay out why I like them, how it is I believe they've been misunderstood, and what this can tell us about media criticism, comic books, and nerd culture in general. So gaze once more, dear children, into the worms. <laughs> God help us all. Let's start with a movie we've discussed on this channel before. Now, since even Zack Snyder's most virulent detractors are all but forced to admit he's brilliant with visuals, I won't go on for too long about how gorgeous of a movie 300 is. The way the Spartans look like living, breathing Greek statues. The way the bronze tint makes us feel like we're gazing directly into antiquity. It all just looks really cool. But it's the subtext that really makes 300 brilliant, and if I were to put that subtext into a single word, it would be propaganda. 300, in my opinion, is an examination of propaganda, both from a contemporary and from a historic perspective. Make every Greek know what happened here. You have a grand tale to tell. Now, the story of the 300 Spartans at Thermopylae as propaganda is nothing new. Isn't there something inherently romantic about a last stand? Harold II's posse fighting to the last man to protect their dead king's body, the Swiss Guard holding St. Peter's Basilica from Charles V so their pope could escape down the tunnels, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, the Battle of Mogadishu, there's something about the idea of a small, doomed, and outnumbered force fighting to the end for a greater cause that just tugs on the human heart like so many marionette strings. And the Battle of of Thermopylae is a tune soldiers the world over have been dancing to for quite literally thousands of years. Oh stranger, tell the Spartans that we lie here obedient to their word. This last message of the fallen heroes rallied Greece to victory, first at Salamis, as predicted, and then at Plataea. But it was more than a victory for Greece. It was a stirring example to free people throughout the world of what a few brave men can accomplish once they refuse to submit to tyranny. This is the entire point of 300. Remember the narrator Delios was sent away from the final battle by Leonidas. But you have another talent unlike any other Spartan. Tell them my story. The most fantastical scenes in the film, the inhuman features of the immortals, whatever the hell this shit is supposed to be, are depicted as highly stylized and surreal, typically accompanied by narration. The insinuation being that what we're seeing may not be perfectly representative of what actually happened. In the end, we find out that the narration is actually the speech Delios is giving to the allied Greek forces before the Battle of Plataea. Here on this ragged patch of earth called Plataea, thanks his heart, face, Obliteration! The enemy outnumber us a paltry three to one! Good odds for any Greek. When asked about the, let's call them fantasy elements, in what was otherwise a fairly historically accurate film, Snyder responded that what we're seeing is 90% accurate, but that Delios is a guy who knows not to wreck a good story with the truth. A beast approaches. It was King Leonidas himself who provoked it.
Leonidas baited Xerxes and sent Delios home ahead of the final battle because he was counting on their deaths being a galvanizing force to unite the rest of the Greek city-states. They assassinate me, all of Sparta goes to war. Pray, now that's stupid. Pray, we're that lucky. Delios tells the story of a heroic final stand against literal inhuman monsters to impassion his army, to make them hate the Persians and fight that much harder to avenge their fallen king and countrymen. To Leonidas and the brave 300! To victory! The propaganda subtext is something that runs throughout most of the film. We see it in Xerxes' overly performative nature, his extravagant displays of wealth and power, the makeup and gold piercings he wears to give the impression of an otherworldly being. It's not the last they fear. It is my divine power. We see it in Ephialtes' desire to belong, to be a part of something. I want to do that, Bob! And look at this, we can see the Spartans fighting what look like actual straw men in the background while Delios narrates. There's an ongoing theme of the Spartans seeking an honorable death in battle, but when Leonidas finally gets there, he has this empty, disappointed, three humps in the back of a limo on prom night look on his face, like, this is it? This is what they were building up all these years? Oh, what does this image look like to you, by the way? Think on it a little, maybe it'll come to you. If you remove that silky voice narration, the Spartans really don't come off as any more noble than the Persians. Of God's no mercy. The Greeks' horror when finding the massacred villagers nailed to the tree, for example, mirrors that of the Persians in seeing the Greeks use their own dead in a similar way. You will pay for your barbarism! Xerxes refers to the Spartans dismissively as a tribe. This is significant because judging by most metrics, the Persian Empire represented a much more sophisticated, what we might call advanced society than Sparta or any of the other Greek city-states at the time. No man. Persian or Greek, no man threatens a messenger. There's no reason we can't be civil. None, sire. The movie opens on a mountain of baby skeletons from all the Spartans that didn't quite pass inspection, and for all Delios and Leonidas' grand talk of freedom, it's debatable how much control over their own fate anyone born into Spartan society really had. Spartans! What is your profession? <laughs> This scene with Stelios bursting out of a spiky, womb-shaped barrier and leaping straight into battle off the back of the man in front of him is, to me, the perfect visual representation of being born into a society that funnels you straight from birth to war. Literally tearing small boys away from their mothers, away from soft things and feminine influence, and plunging them into a world of pure testosterone-driven male violence. Toward the death on the battlefield, in service to Sparta the greatest glory he could achieve in his life. This symbol on the Spartan shields is a lambda, the 11th character of the Greek alphabet. Before the Peloponnesian War, each soldier painted whatever sigil they wanted on their shields, but around the 5th century this was adopted as the symbol for Lacedaemonia, the region of Greece in which Sparta was located. But this sort of angular, upward-thrusting shape can also be a symbol of masculinity, especially in an artistic context, a sort of spatial phallus, if you will. And doesn't this version of it also look a lot like the stripes that the military gives out to signify rank? Look at this scene where it cuts from a bloody spear in battle to a fresh spearhead being forged in Sparta. Then the camera pans over and we see Leonidas' son running around in plain before we come in on this conversation. Your son Sassy Gogi next year. That is always a difficult time for a Spartan mother. We're seeing the examination of a society that forges children into weapons. Well, haven't you noticed we've been sharing our culture with you all morning? You know, when you think about the way Spartan society is structured, what they value, Xerxes is actually offering Leonidas some pretty favorable terms. I'll make a warlord of all Greece. You will carry my battle standard to the heart of Europa. You fight for your lands. Keep them. You fight for Sparta. She will be wealthier and more powerful than ever before. 
He gives him chance after chance to come to a peaceful resolution, and not only does Leonidas reject all of them while killing every emissary sent his way, but he tries to assassinate Xerxes the last time he makes the offer. Something Xerxes himself did not do when he had Leonidas in a similarly vulnerable position. Xerxes yells slaughter them to his archers because to him, Leonidas and the Spartans have shown themselves to be dumb, brutish animals, incapable of reason and fit only for slaughter. Here, by Spartan law. We lie. There's an overarching critique in 300 of a certain brand of masculinity, and it's one that can be found throughout most of Snyder's body of work. Leonidas violently rejects Xerxes' initial offer because the Athenians have already turned you down. And if those philosophers and uh, boy lovers found that kind of nerve. Even while the Spartans themselves are queer coded in a way that both satirizes homophobic masculine archetypes and subverts the Hollywood stereotype of the effeminate gay man. They look thirsty! Well, let's give them something to drink! The Battle of Thermopylae is somewhat of a racially charged topic these days, given the historical parallels some people choose to draw between the second Persian invasion of Greece and what they perceive to be modern cultural conflicts between the East and West. And one of the big xenophobia classics has always been the idea of the invading other coming for your women or children. Sparta will burn! Her men will die in arms and her women and children will be slaves or worse! But Leonidas, this image of the righteous patriarch, leaves his wife to be raped by one of his own people so he can go off and kill the scary foreigner who really wants to be his ally. She's the last thing he calls out for in the end, but he realizes too late that his glorious death doesn't quite balance out what he's lost in life. I have lived my entire life without regret until now. It's not that my son gave up his life for his country. It's just that I never told him that I loved him the most. In a lot of ways, 300 is what you could call a modern Greek tragedy. Ephialtes, in betraying the Greeks to Xerxes, is given everything he could have ever asked for, but is ultimately denied the one thing he's always wanted. May he live forever. Artemis gives his son the nod of approval you can tell the latter has waited for his entire life, and in doing so distracts him just long enough to get him killed. Not even in proper battle, but with his back turned and his defenses down. And Leonidas, realizing in that last moment how much of a waste it all was, how his warrior lifestyle only took him from the things that were really important, My queen! just embraces his own end. The final speech Leonidas gives to his men brings his entire life as a Spartan full circle. He calls them children, announces they'll dine in hell with a manic grin on his face. And by Spartan law, we will stand and fight and die. A lot of this subtext seems to have been uh, missed by some of the more fringe film critics and ill-staffed publications of the time. The New York Times, for example, called 300 as violent as Apocalypto and twice as dumb. Dana Stevens of Slate compared it to The Eternal Jew, an anti-Semitic propaganda film put out by the Nazis during the Holocaust, and this was not the only such comparison I came across. A number of people walked out of the premiere at the Berlin Film Festival, and others stood up and booed when the credits rolled. Lindsay Ellis, a brilliant YouTuber whose shadow, quite frankly, none of us will ever escape from, called the film INSIDIOUS. And there are multiple videos on YouTube calling it fascist propaganda, some insinuating that Snyder himself is a closet fascist. The Iranian government put out a statement calling 300 psychological warfare and American propaganda, banning it from being seen in the country. Now, I'm certainly not going to tell any Iranian person whether or not they have the right to be offended by anything they see in this movie, but there are two things I would suggest keeping in mind. First, part of what made the Iranian media so uncomfortable with 300 was that it seemed to feminize Xerxes. So in part, I do think this represents a backlash to the larger critique Schneider is making of toxic masculinity and homophobia. Your Athenian rivals will kneel at your feet. If you will, but kneel at mine. And the second thing is I really do believe the historical inaccuracies regarding the Persians are reflective of Greek war propaganda within the film, not of any animus that Zack Schneider himself has for the Iranian people. And this is part of a through line to his work which is highly critical of war and of American military aggression. You haven't idealized mankind, but you've, you've deformed it. You've mutilated it. That's your legacy. 
Of course, not all the commentary was negative. Slavjaw Ziggy, a person I'd apparently know more about if I read Big Boy Things, had a significantly more subversive take on the material. Keeping the analogy to the modern geopolitics of the Persian Gulf, but correctly, in my opinion, pointing out that in 300, the Persian army represents the larger, wealthier force with far more sophisticated military technology. Not unlike the United States, while the Greeks, and the Spartans in particular, are much more analogous to present-day Iran, a small, outnumbered nation reliant on the homeland advantage and nationalistic pride. Zizek compares the archers raining death on the Greeks from the safety of the cliffs with rockets being fired from American warships in the Persian Gulf. The multi-ethnic, imperialistic Persians with the modern United States and the Spartans with something like the Taliban or the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, ready to fight to the death against an invading superpower. We face the most massive army ever assembled. We will use our superior fighting skills and the terrain of Greece itself to destroy them. You know, when I bring a lot of this stuff up to, let's call them film people, those I'd think would be most appreciative of the perspective, I get a surprising amount of resistance to the idea that Zack Snyder could have possibly been doing anything clever beyond making a well-shot action movie. Cause, you know, again, he's great with visuals. Oh, I see. So you think Zack Snyder is some kind of secret genius that only you can appreciate? Hmm, hmm, hmm. Now, personally, I don't think it matters whether Snyder is being deliberately clever or just sort of bumbles his way into all the subtext you can find in his movies. I really do think art is produced mostly on the subconscious level, and honestly, it just doesn't matter to me all that much whether Snyder himself is brilliant or he just happens to accidentally make beautiful films that move me on an intellectual level. That being said, filmmakers typically don't put the level of care and attention to visual detail it requires to make something this good looking by accident. And you know, for those who accuse him of being like a fascist sympathizer or even a fascist himself based on some vague combination of Rorschach, Leonidas, and this picture of him lifting weights, I don't know, I don't see a fascist adopting multiple non-white children, and for what it's worth, this guy played Xerxes in the original 300 Spartans. Say what you will about Snyder's version, at least all the Persians are Persian, you know? Now, the movie Snyder made after 300 is actually about a bunch of openly fascistic owls who kidnap children and brainwash them into a sort of Hitler youth reminiscent owl militia that also kind of parallels the US military. And the one after that, of course, was the infamous Watchmen adaptation about a false flag attack carried out to reorganize global power structures around energy shit with a stand-in for Dick Cheney being shot in the face. But we're not gonna talk about either of these today. I think part of the reason Snyder gets as much bad faith criticism as he does, and he does, is that most of his films are adaptations. Specifically adaptations of comic books. Specifically, specifically adaptations of some of the most iconic and widely beloved stories in comic books, and he isn't afraid to put his own slant on things, even while technically making a near frame-for-frame -frame adaptation of the source material. Interestingly enough, the one what you could call Snyder original story is also the one which I feel most directly deals with the issues he's had adapting comic books and nerd culture in general. I take care of these girls. I look out for them. These are my girls. Sucker Punch is by far Zack Snyder's most unpopular movie. Which isn't to say it's his least popular movie, that's the owl thing. And I think that's a shame because I really enjoy Sucker Punch, but it's also not something I'm entirely surprised by given the nature of what the film actually is. Big dog, a boss hog, what I want is the question. Ready or a boy, make a big noise, playing in the street, gonna be a big man. The story in Sucker Punch plays out across multiple layers of narrative, and I kind of get a kick out of this having come out less than a year after Inception, because Zack Schneider and Christopher Nolan's respective outputs complement each other in some really fascinating ways that I can't really get into right now without doubling the runtime of this video. The first layer, the one presented to us as being most reflective of the reality in which the story takes place, opens on our protagonist, the recently orphaned baby doll being locked in an asylum by her abusive stepfather who schemes with a corrupt staff to have her lobotomized in order to take possession of her inheritance. I don't know what you did to this girl, and frankly, I don't want to know. But what are you going to tell the detectives when they come snooping around? I'm sure they're going to love to get her side of the story. Yeah. I don't have a doctor on staff who does lobotomies, what? but 
there just happens to be one scheduled to come in. He'll be here in five days, so I'll just forge her signature. I've done it a dozen times. The second layer, where the majority of the film plays out, is a fantasy in which Baby Doll's stepfather plays a priest from a Catholic orphanage who sells her to a brothel owned by a man named Blue. Blue owns the club, and we, my dear, <laughs> are the main attractions. He brings in his clients, and we gotta make him feel, you know. Special. Along with four other girls, Sweet Pea, Rocket, Amber, and Blondie, Baby Doll concocts a plan to escape before a figure referred to only as the High Roller can arrive and take her virginity. The plan necessitates gathering a series of items the girls need to get outside, with Baby Doll's primary role being to distract the authorities, the various gatekeepers standing between them and what they need with a highly sexualized dance that the audience never actually gets to see. We'd be doing all the work while you prance around with a perfect alibi. No, as long as I'm dancing. When Baby Doll starts dancing, we're taken to the third layer, the one presented in the trailers and promotional material as representing the main focus of the movie and consisting entirely of a series of stylized and unconnected sci-fi fantasy action sequences in which the girls fight their way across various battlefields decked out in stilettos and fetishized action gear while violence and destruction are dealt out through a series of increasingly phallic vehicles. This is where the titular sucker punch comes in. Zack Schneider took a lot of shit when he adapted Watchmen. Like, a not insignificant number of people were quite convinced that 300 was fascist propaganda, and they still did not take it as personally or retaliate with as much vitriol as a certain type of comic book fan did when he adapted Alan Moore's masterpiece. The criticism from many was that Schneider didn't get Watchmen, didn't get the satirical nature of it. To the point where even a decade after the film's release, articles are still coming out explaining this. In particular, this scene of Rorschach jumping off a roof in the rain really seemed to to convince people that Schneider thinks comic book heroes are cool as effing shit. <laughs> Why is shit okay but not fucking? Anyway, his big follow-up to Watchmen draws you in with these gorgeous scenes of chicks dancing around in high heels and fetish gear fighting robots and dragons and Nazi zombies and shit, but instead of some big escapist spectacle a la The Avengers designed to cater specifically to a certain kind of male audience, like the one that spent the past decade in change waging a spike campaign against Schneider and everything he does. We get something that spits directly in the face of the Avengers target audience and arguably on the concept of escapism itself. It's a sucker punch to comic book nerds who pretend to be all woke and feminist while churning out and pawing over material every bit as exploitative and demeaning to women as the patriarchal power structures they claim to be critiquing. Here's the thing. This show might be yours, but the girls and you mine. Me. Your father. Your lover. Your employer! Plotting to take from me my most precious possessions, your very self. <laughs> There's not a doubt in my mind that Zack Schneider loves comic books, but he fucking despises comic book fans, or at least a certain type of comic book fan, and Sucker Punch is nothing so much as a treaty on the most toxic ways in which nerd culture relates to women, both as fans and as creators. The men in Sucker Punch, with one exception, are a concentration of the most repugnant, vile, and generally unsympathetic pieces of shit you can scrape off the underside of an Applebee's. Whiny, violent, unsanitary, greedy, oozing with an inadequacy and a kind of licentious entitlement, using whatever tiny power they can accumulate to exploit and prey upon the bodies of the women in their care. I hold my money with my left, got the world in my right pocket, smoker, stoker, my right in between, counting my profits, poker, faces I soak up the taste and display of women on my sofa, doing the type of things I love so much. Sucker Punch plays on all the most exploitative and misogynistic tropes in comic books, sci-fi, fantasy, the whole Slave Leia thing, and presents it in a way that utterly defies the audience to find so much as a titillating frame. I get the sexy little schoolgirl. I even get the helpless mental patient, right? That can be hot. But what is this? Lobotomized vegetable? 
Baby Doll is all tricked out in fetish gear and pigtails in a way that makes her look both sexualized and childlike. She always has this sad, pained expression on her face during the action sequences that can't help but remind the audience what's actually happening to her. Where is my mind? Where is my mind? There's a kind of connecting thread between Sweet Pea and Baby Doll from the moment we make the initial jump from the real world to the first layer of the fantasy. Stop! Get that thing away from me. Get it away from me! And shut off that damn music! Sweet Pea is hostile to Baby Doll from the onset, and she's the only one who doesn't seem impressed by the younger girl's dance. Both of their younger sisters die in ways they feel responsible for, Baby Doll having shot her sister in the film's opening while trying to protect her from their stepfather, and Rocket having thrown herself in front of the cook's knife to protect Sweet Pea with her own body. Sweet Pea and Baby Doll eventually make it out of the brothel, but they can't both escape the grounds, and in the end, Baby Doll sacrifices herself so Sweet Pea can get away. This was never my story. Yours. She's brought back inside and given to the High Roller, who turns into the lobotomist as the procedure is completed and the dream seemingly comes to a close. The last we see of Sweet Pea is her getting onto a bus, aided by the old man seen in Baby Doll's fantasy sequences. I don't have a ticket. I know. It's okay. Go find a seat in the back. Try and get some sleep. We got a long way to go. Some have taken this to mean that what we're seeing is still part of Baby Doll's fantasy, her mind now completely closed off to the real world, but I think there's a bit more to it than that. Sweet Pea is taller than Baby Doll, taller than any of the other girls, and is consistently depicted as being the pragmatic one, the adult in the group. She's suspicious of Baby Doll, convinced she's gonna get her sister killed, and there are a lot of little scenes where they look at each other in a mirror or say things like this. I'm the star of the show, remember? We don't see Baby Doll's face for a long time after she's lobotomized, and there are indications that even the level of narrative presented to us as representing the real world may in fact be another layer of fantasy. The film opens on curtains being pulled back, hinting that we're still being told a story, and Baby Doll's stepfather has the same black eyes effect that the Persian immortals do when he attacks her in a very stylized opening. I think Sweet Pea and Baby Doll are the same person, that Sweet Pea is Baby Doll having grown up. There are certain visual signals signifiers connecting various levels of the story. The slain younger sister, violent penetration, a bullet shell falling to the ground, a light bulb breaking. I think something happened to Baby Doll. Someone got shot, her sister died, and when she came out the other end of that experience, she was Sweet Pea. Sweet Pea is suspicious that Baby Doll will get Rocket killed because she blames herself, or more specifically the girl she once was, for her little sister's death. Baby Doll sacrifices herself so Sweet Pea can escape because sometimes, in order to grow, in order to become someone else, our younger self has to be left behind. The movie itself has been her retelling of her own story, the journey that brought her from that one person to the other. The old man is someone who helped her out of a bad situation, and she put him in the story. Remember, don't ever write a check with your mouth, you can't cash with your ass. But there's still more to it. I consider Sucker Punch to be as much about art as it is about misogyny and exploitation. We see this in the scene between Baby Doll and the High Roller. Played by John Hamm, pretty much the face of creative consumerism as far as 2011 pop culture was concerned, the High Roller is depicted nowhere near as base or disgusting as the other men who visit blues. He's not interested in forcing himself on Baby Doll, at least not directly, because it's not her body he wants. It's the thing that can't be taken. He wants her to love him in an authentic way, not because he's paying for something artificial. You want me to lie to you? No, I don't. All I require from you is a sliver of a moment. I think this is how Snyder sees the movie making process, comic book movies in particular, and the way studios buy off artists to, if you'll forgive how pretentious this sounds, capture their truths. If Blue represents the territorial nerd who only understands sex and art through entitlement or possessiveness, You'll never have me. Ever. 
then the high roller is this archetype we have of the Hollywood money man who sees art as just another commodity to be bought and sold. I think Snyder sees having to work for studios like having to whore yourself out to wealthy money men. It's demeaning and can even feel violating, but in an insane, corrupt, greedy world, sometimes it's the only way you, and by extension your art, can survive. It's just the best option available, and sometimes, just sometimes, even against all the odds, with all the compromises, and the whoring yourself out, and selling off little bits of yourself, sometimes you can still find that moment of genuine truth amidst all the ugliness. Sometimes you can still reach someone. Did you... Did you see the way she looked at me? Just in that last moment. The high roller penetrates baby doll, breaks her hymen in the brothel at the exact moment the doctor lobotomizes her in the asylum. In the final moment, as it's happening, he sees something in her eyes that makes him question what he's doing. She's able to reach him for just an instant and communicate something. He brings his reservations up with Gorski, and she realizes that Blue forged her signature on the medical forms. But I don't agree with this solution, Doctor. But why would you sign for a procedure you don't agree with? I take care of these girls. I look out for them. These are my girls. Tell them. Tell them! Get him out of here. No! Ah, wait! Wait, wait, wait! Wait! It's not me you want to step on! Ah, I'll tell you everything! I'll tell you! If Baby Doll represents the initial idea inside the artist's mind, pure and unmolested, then Sweet Pea represents the realized form, the movie we actually get to see. You have to live for all of us, ma'am. <laughs> Baby, no. You yes, can't do Sweet Pea. You're the strongest. You're the only one of us that ever had a chance out there. You're going home and living, that's how we win. One of my favorite scenes in Sucker Punch is the musical bit where Blue and Gorski sing Love is the Drug while each of the girls performs their dance and Baby Doll can be seen cooking and doing laundry in the background. Musical montages like this are one of the things Snyder is most known for, and aside from just being a really well shot piece of filmmaking, I think it kind of says some interesting things with regards to the critique Sucker Punch is making of exploitation and false empowerment, as well as the general roles society is comfortable with women taking, servants, caregivers things to be protected or punished. Large portions of it were cut from the theatrical version of the film, as well as a few other important scenes, such as the final interaction between Baby Doll and the High Roller. Some of this was added back in for home release, but apparently there's an even longer director's cut out there featuring, among other things, a musical number from Baby Doll that has yet to see the light of day. A lot of Zack Snyder's films get this kind of treatment, which I think really represents a loss, both for the artists whose work winds up being messed with, and for the fans who miss out on the complete story as a result. And it is artists, plural. If a word like auteur applies to anyone, it applies to Zack Snyder, but if left solely to his own devices, none of these films could ever exist. Film is a collaborative medium, maybe the ultimate collaborative medium. It's something where dozens or even hundreds of artists come together to create something no single one of them could make on their own. Many fans of Zack Snyder and his films have rallied around seeing completed versions of certain works of his, and in doing so have made him, in the eyes of of many a kind of figurehead for the rights of the artist. There's something kind of poetic about this when you think about where the discourse surrounding Snyder's work was about 10 years ago, but the truth is he's far from the only one whose work is being messed with when these films are cut down. How many hours do you think it took to animate the Black Freighter segment of Watchmen only for it to be cut from the theatrical release? How long do you think Emily Browning spent rehearsing for Baby Doll's musical number, which has yet to be released in any format at all? I see Sucker Punch as the repudiation of this idea idea some people have of the perfect crystalline vision that exists within the mind of the artist. Baby Doll is pretty and captivating in a kind of way, but she's not real. She never feels authentic as a person the way Sweet Pea does. All that gyrating and moaning, the dance should be more than just titillation. Mine's personal. It says who I am. What the heck does yours say? It says I'm gonna escape from here. Sucker Punch is the movie where I feel like I finally started to get Zack Snyder, where I went, oh, 
he's making that kind of movie, and suddenly all these little things from his other films started to make sense. Imagine for a moment if people applied the same sort of narrative strictures to something like Antichrist or Mother that people cite as evidence of Snyder's movies being dog shit. It would come off as complete goddamn gibberish, right? To me, Zack Snyder's movies are something like visual poetry. There's a lot of symbolism and visual storytelling that's doing the legwork for straightforward narrative realism. And I feel this often doesn't get taken into consideration by people who point out what they perceive to be plot holes or other structural narrative failings in these movies. It's like reading poetry and judging it by the prosaic standards of a novel. This isn't to say one is better or worse than the other, they're just different types of writing. There's this sense among a lot of cinephiles, the real elites, you know, people with Greek screen Names, that Zack Schneider can't be making high art, capital F films, because he's adapting comic books. And in fact, the lack of conformity of his work to the standards of what we typically think of as a properly adapted comic book movie represent his failure as a director. And then comic book nerds hate him for reasons that are... <laughs> Legion. I don't know, I guess there's something about a man without a country I just can't help but root for. Of course, not everyone is as generous in their readings of these films as I am. Zack Snyder, definition. Anytime a person tells an elaborate story with no point or plot whatsoever. <laughs> Do you ever wonder how zombies became so played out? Or why blockbusters have to be dark and gritty these days? This is a story about a bad film director and the very bad ideas their movies are spreading. If war kicks off with Iran in the coming months, I'll know where to point the finger of blame. And it won't be the White House. Well, Snyder's directing again, so you can throw any possibilities of the film containing subtlety or nuance right out the window. Snyder's flattened and killed lots of other great female characters, and some male ones too, so now we'll obviously ruin the first modern interpretation of Wonder Woman, or she even gets her own movie. Where can I send the petition to get them to release the even worse cut of Justice League? He said that you were the thirstiest young woman he ever met. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, well, part of the reason I'm not interested in doing analyses of movies that are, like, in theaters on this channel is that I really don't think you can properly judge a film after a single viewing. I've just had too many experiences where I think something is shit only to come back a few years and several thousand joints later and view it in a completely different light, see new angles and aspects to the story and filmmaking I hadn't been able to fully appreciate before. And the reverse is also true. There have been movies I've seen and thought were amazing only to go back later and find them not quite as flawless as I remembered. This has kind of been the relationship I've had with a lot of the Marvel Disney movies, if I'm being honest. I'll watch the Avengers, Guardians of the Galaxy, the Thor and Iron Man movies in theaters sometimes more than once, but when it's been out for a year or so, I don't think I ever really go back and rewatch them. If I put one on Netflix or something, cough cough, I usually find myself skipping to the big action scenes. The airport fight in Civil War, anytime the immigrant song starts playing in Thor Ragnarok, but I never really sit down and just watch the whole thing beginning to end the way I will with a movie I really enjoy. And I don't think I'm the only one who relates this way to a certain type of media. The action fantasies baby doll experiences while she's dancing aren't connected to each other or to any sort of overarching plot in a straightforward sense. There's symbolic meaning to some of the things we're seeing. The scenes of her fighting giant enemies with phallic weapons is a metaphor for her daily battle against the predatory men who have power over her life and see her as a sexual object. Cutting the baby dragon's throat to get its fire stones represents the protagonist killing her younger, innocent self to become stronger, killing Baby Doll to become Sweet Pea. But as far as the physics of why what we're seeing actually exists in the form that it does, who cares? Why are there orcs? Because there are orcs. Why do the girls have silencers on their automatic weapons in the middle of a very noisy medieval siege? Because it's cool. I first saw this movie in theaters with two friends when I was 21 years old. One of them began critiquing how unrealistic Baby Doll being able to use a katana without any training was, the other complained loudly and frequently that we never got to see her dance, and for my own part I was incensed at the bait and switch of what the trailers promised versus what we actually saw in the theater. It took a few years for me to appreciate Sucker Punch for what it is. Shit, I saw 300 when I was a teenager and it was well over a decade before I picked up on its deconstructive nature. Some movies just 
require you to take a little bit of time, sometimes a lot of bit of time, to ruminate on them before things really click into place. And this is something we should all keep in mind for the next section, which, be warned, people with comic book avatars may find disturbing. <laughs> Where to begin? Look, I'm not saying the discourse surrounding Batman v Superman was the most toxic I'd ever seen leading up to this kind of movie. But let's be honest, it was pretty bad. What the fuck? I've used the phrase cultural vandalism to describe Batman v Superman. Zack Snyder, you loser, you idiot. And does genuine violence to 80 plus years worth of cherished American pop mythology. Wait, we have the same mom's names? <laughs> okay, we're friends. <laughs> Submerging religious symbols in urine, burning a national flag. Yeah, I would compare the production of this film as it relates to Superman to all of those. Zack Snyder failed as a director. I need him gone. And Affleck is a superior director to Zack Snyder. I disagree with the Rotten Tomatoes 30%, which is, it should be low. Because this will be some worthless piece of shit. Such efforts, as they are wont to do in the realm of online discourse, have dovetailed in recent years in common cause with the digital harassment campaigns of the so-called alt-right. Do you prefer the DC comic book movies to what Disney Marvel is putting out? Oh, you're a fascist. Speaking of, uh, politics, I've actually wondered myself now and again what Zack Snyder's own political affiliations might be. I mean, the guy has such a charged reputation, I figure he has to have some kind of crazy skeletons in his closet, right? But, you know, the more I look into him and into the things he's said and done, the less sure I am what it is he actually believes. And if I can't figure it out, then you definitely can't, because you're the one watching my video. See how that works? So I won't pretend to know what Snyder's politics are. What I do know is that his body of work is highly inclusive, consistently featuring prominent roles for queer people, women, and people of color, that it's critical of war while distinguishing between the troops and the military-industrial complex, and that it frequently criticizes capitalism, violent masculinity, and patriarchal power structures. So why are there dozens of articles written about how he's this big-time objectivist? Why are there videos on YouTube calling him a crypto-fascist? Where is this reputation coming from. There are three quotes in particular I often hear cited as evidence of Zack Snyder being either a ham-fisted simpleton too dim to understand the subtext and satirical nature of the stories he's been allowed to violate, or an irredeemably twisted psychopath committing cultural vandalism who must be destroyed at all cost. Batman could get raped in prison in my movie, fuck Marvel, and The Fountainhead is an interesting book. To which I reply, get over it, that was David Ayer, and... <sighs> Let's talk about The Fountainhead. Or, more specifically, let's talk about the woman who wrote The Fountainhead. I haven't read either of Ayn Rand's most famous novels. Turns out no one has. But her work has been inspirational to plenty of writers I do very much enjoy and admire. Like James Clavell, who, in addition to King Rat and some forgettable book about ninjas or something, wrote Taipan, quite possibly the greatest father-son story of all time. To be honest, I really don't know much more about Ayn Rand or her work, beyond that she's gotten somewhat of a politically charged reputation after Ted Cruz and a bunch of assholes named Paul made her the figurehead for the philosophy of being a selfish dick. But I'm not going to discount a director whose work I very much enjoy because they may have drawn inspiration from a controversial book. Interestingly enough, Zack Snyder is himself now planning on directly adapting The Fountainhead, so maybe I'll have to read it after all. It sounds like the kind of thing I'd be interested to see his interpretation of. Honestly, whatever his vision for it might be, I have to respect the guy for even attempting that adaptation. This is the man who remade Dawn of the Dead, who had adapted Watchmen and gave 300 the Starship Troopers treatment. And this is to say nothing of the balls it took to make Man of Steel the way he did. Props, by the way, which go out to everyone involved in the project, not just the director, because there may in fact be a Harry Potter Defense Against the Dark Arts style curse on the character of Superman, given that every actor who portrays him either dies prematurely or finds it impossible to get meaningful work after. Toss a coin to your witcher, oh valley of plenty, oh valley of plenty, oh. Kirk Allen, George Reeve, Lee Quigley, perhaps most famously Christopher Reeve, who survived a terrible, life-changing injury while playing Superman, recovered over years, had a remarkable life and career afterwards. The guy cameos in two episodes of Smallville, bam, dead. Speaking of Smallville, has anybody seen Tom Welling since that show went off the air? Yeah, me neither. <laughs> Still stronger. 
Nicolas Cage only got a partial dose of the curse, the Tim Burton Superman movie never having actually made it to fruition, and he hasn't been the same since. Looking over all these past incarnations of Superman, all these interpretations, it really just makes the negative reaction Man of Steel got all the more puzzling and indeed disappointing. The biggest complaint I remember hearing was that it didn't feel like Superman. Or rather, it didn't feel like what people expected from Superman, what they wanted him to be. The Henry Cavill Superman, it's the Jesus story, right? I mean, he's like a tragic savior with this godlike father who's also a ghost. And there's like a rebel who's banished to a bottomless pit in space and he like falls to earth and he tempts the sun who's like not. <laughs> And the son is like a sacrifice, and he's feared and mistrusted by the people he's trying to help, and then later he goes to a mountain. Shit, that's the other guy. But, but, but they're doing the Jesus, is my point. It's very straightforward. Though, it's also not your traditional take on the Christ story. This Superman is cold, resentful, perpetually crushed under the weight of his own destiny. He's 33 in Man of Steel, which in retrospect should have been a clue that they'd be going here sooner rather than later. Your doomsday. Superman's casket goes into the Earth the same way that the Kryptonian thumb drive goes into the ship's terminal, which is what allows Jor-El to upload his consciousness, his spirit, if you will, into the ship itself. This symbolizes the spirit of Superman's sacrifice, for lack of a better term, uploading itself into our world. Superman is gone, but in this sense, his spirit is still with us. He can't save us anymore, but his sacrifice can inspire us to save each other. And maybe, just maybe... I remember a YouTube comment from back in like 2012 or so when Man of Steel was first coming out that made a very distinct impression on me. It talked about Superman's origins being the creation of two Jewish immigrants in the early 20th century made to inspire hope in people. It went on about what Superman has meant to each generation and ended saying that America is heading into troubled waters and needs Superman again. It was a pretty good comment, as YouTube comments go. It was succinct, topical, didn't say anything disparaging about Muslims, pretty much the gold standard, really. So this isn't any shade against the author, whoever that nameless poet may be. But I think it's reflective of an unfortunate attitude that a lot of comic book fans have regarding these stories and characters. Even before Man of Steel came out, people had already made up their minds on what the movie should be, what it was supposed to be. Which, to my way of thinking, represents a very narrow path for someone to walk without retreading what's already been done with the character in previous adaptations. Personally, I kinda like it when a character or a story we know is taken in a new direction that maybe we're not accustomed to. Which brings us to Batman v Superman, and before we really start digging into it, there is one thing to keep in mind about the film. Which is to say... It's a fucking Watchmen adaptation! Let me say that again for all the second year film students in the back swapping the same three points back and forth about how Snyder didn't get the satirical nature of The Dark Knight Returns. Batman v Superman is a spiritual adaptation of Watchmen. Where Rorschach was a satirization of right-wing American paranoia during the Cold War, Snyder's Batman satirizes post-9-11 reactionary hysteria. That son of a bitch brought the war to us. We believe there's even a 1% chance that he is our enemy. We have to take it as an absolute certainty. Dr. Manhattan? Fucking duh. Remember, Alan Moore's Watchmen takes place in an alternate timeline, which breaks away from our own in June of 1938 with the publication of Action Comics No. 1, the first appearance of Superman. This was what inspired the original heroes in Watchmen to start putting on costumes and fighting crime. Then there's Wonder Woman, who, you know, straddles the line between symbol of female empowerment and male objectification fantasy. Hmm. He sent you this? Sure, they're very valuable, like antiques. Mother, this is gross. Well, I think it's kind of flattering. That cool as effing shit line came from a Collider article written 10 years after the release of Watchmen, I guess just to commemorate how much the author didn't like it and how Zack Snyder simply didn't get the satire at play. Citing as evidence of this decade wrought thesis, the action scenes in Batman v Superman being too cool. Maybe they just missed the scenes of Superman torturing prisoners to death and Batman quoting Dick Cheney, but I'm afraid I have to question just how much the author really gets the satire at play in Batman v Superman. So many of Batman's gadgets look like guns because we're meant to think something about the character, that this is an older, harder Batman than we've ever seen before. Which, you know, has never been done before in the comics or in other adaptations.
The guns are unsettling when this Batman uses them. They're meant to be shocking. In the Tim Burton movies, they're fun. And not for nothing, but if all these hardcore comic fans hadn't been so fucking distracted by Batman holding what looks like a gun, they might have noticed that Wonder Woman is occupying the center position traditionally held by Superman in this lineup. Food for thought. And of course Lois Lane figures out who Superman is almost immediately. Harry, come on, it's me we're talking about. I'm a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter. Superhero comics go to an absurd length to explain why thousands of people aren't being killed every time two super beings have a punch fight in the middle of a crowded city. Batman v Superman rubs your face in it, forces the audience to confront the aftermath of such a spectacle in grisly, merciless detail. This is another thing that puts some people off in Man of Steel, where we can't pretend for an instant that people aren't being crushed literally like bugs while Superman and Zod are smashing each other through buildings. It's horrifying the way the Kryptonians just tear people apart like they're made of paper. And then you come and say to me something about like, oh, my superhero wouldn't do that. I'm like, are you serious? Like, I'm like down the fucking road on that. You know what I mean? So, and it's a cool point of view. Look, I'm 100% fine with it. There, it's a cool point of view to be like, my heroes are still innocent. You know, my heroes didn't fucking, you know, lie to America. My heroes didn't you know, embezzle money from their corp- My heroes didn't fucking commit any atrocities. I'm like, that's cool, but you're living in a fucking dream world, okay? So. That was from a panel at a charity screening in which somebody asked Snyder about Batman killing people in these movies. It was reported by various publications as a profane tirade and a rant accompanied by this picture. What an honest way of reporting the Q&A segment of a charity event. And I love more than anything, you know, Superman and Batman, but in, you know, in the same way that Alan Moore had was fed up with the fucking like, okay, no, you know, they do this. The great shame to me of the whole affair surrounding these movies and the way they were received is that most of what people were put off by really seemed to become more palatable as the larger story unfolds. The mass urban destruction that felt so gratuitous in Man of Steel made a lot more sense after Batman v Superman came out and we all saw where they were going with it. When Ben Affleck was cast as Batman, the internet lost its collective shit for what felt like months, and many of Batman v Superman's most vocal critics have praised his portrayal of the character as one of the best parts of the movie. My own made your beef with Batman v Superman the first time I saw it was that it felt like too much was crammed in. In particular, Doomsday and the death of Superman really felt tacked on. But, you know, re-watching it and trying to pick out what I can of the original story in Justice League, I do see the bones of something very interesting, very Snyder-like, and very unconventional for a comic book movie to attempt. Now God is good as dead. Zod's final act in Man of Steel is to attack Superman and the people of Earth because he sees them as having taken away his reason for being. I exist only to protect Krypton. That is the sole purpose for which I was born. I'm going to make them suffer, Cal. These humans you've adopted. I will take them all from you, one by one. He forces Superman to kill him, essentially committing suicide by cop because he no longer has any reason to live except to take his anger out on a world that stole his vision of paradise. There's only one way this ends, Cal. Either you die, or I do. No! Never. Lex Luthor reanimates his body in a kind of existential tantrum at the vacuum created by Superman's existence and the death of traditional human notions of meaning. Doomsday is the embodiment of Zod's nihilistic rage, incubated in the Nietzschean twilight of idols. The first thing it does is attack its creator because it's angry at being alive without a purpose. And when it kills Superman, there are these black veins growing along the spike protruding from its arm, like it's injecting something into the hope symbol on his chest. But... The bell's already been rung, and they've heard it. 
out in the dark among the stars. <laughs> In Justice League, or at least the version we've been allowed to see thus far, I do see the early stages of what I think would have been Snyder's take on Reign of the Superman. But instead of an exploration of grief and the futility of trying to replace a loved one after they're gone, Justice League was to have been about finding purpose in a meaningless universe. Instead of a series of Superman stand-ins wearing literal S's on their chests, we're given alternate paths to meaning. God is dead, so now what? Do we continue bonding with machinery in hopes of one day transcending our flesh? immerse ourselves in art and culture, cram as much work, food, and media as we can into the time we've got. It caused me to burn a tremendous amount of calories, so I am just a black hole of snacks. Live lives of pure individualism where we act for our own interests and values or build financial and technological empires. You could tell they were going a certain way with it and that it was saying something about us, about people. Sticking with the Christ metaphor, imagine if the fascist soldiers in the nightmare had crosses on their shoulders instead of Superman's crest. It makes me think of a quote I've heard, sometimes attributed to FDR, other times to Billy Graham. When fascism comes to America, it'll come wrapped in a flag and carrying a cross. Of course, the final version version of Justice League wound up going in a different direction with things. I believe in truth, but I'm also a big fan of justice. In the end, God has returned to set everything to rights, Wonder Woman is back off to the side where she belongs, and the Flash finally gets his fist bump. Booyah. I've enjoyed almost all of the DC movies that have come out since the Nolan trilogy wrapped up. Almost all of them. Though I can understand how Batman v Superman might not be everyone's cup of tea. But I hope we can all agree that this chimera of a movie was not in any way, shape, or form an improvement in tone or in anything else. No! No! I said you don't go! You can match me. There are parts of it I liked. The opening montage, which I was surprised to find was in fact made by Joss Whedon, was pretty cool. The Kent Farm being foreclosed on is actually very powerful imagery, and <laughs> this guy with the sign right here, that's for sure supposed to be a nod to Snyder's efforts, saying like, I tried, but fuck it, I give up, this is what you said you wanted, hope you enjoy it. My man. I bought the bank. Like I said, very interesting that Zack Snyder is now adapting The Fountainhead. People wanted this to be like the Marvel movies, specifically like the Disney Marvel franchise, only with the DC lineup. They wanted the big build-up where everybody gets their own little origin movie, then the team-up, then the big crossover event, etc. and so forth. What we got was a little different, but in my opinion, still very worthwhile. The Marvel movies are fun. I'm not denying that. I have fun watching them. I've seen most of them in theaters and own several on Blu-ray, definitely all the ones I use footage of in this video. They did something really amazing building this universe, this franchise, and they... <sighs> Thanos was a stupid fucking villain, okay? Everyone knows most of the Marvel villains are bad, but don't act like Thanos is the good one. His plan is to destroy half the life in the universe to, what, conserve resources? How does a Malthusian apocalypse make any fucking sense where interstellar travel is this easy and there are other habitable planets? What happens when people just start breeding again? Why not just double the resources? In the next movie, I guess he realizes how fucking stupid this plan was and decides to just do the generic villain thing anyway. Destroy the universe, become a god. I will shred this universe down to its last atom. And then, with the stones you've collected for me, create a new one, teeming with life, that knows not what it has lost, but only what it has been given. This was pretty good, though. I'm sorry, Earth is closed today. Like I said, fun stuff. The villains are simplistic because they're supposed to be. It's escapism. In Batman v Superman, the villains are nihilism, capitalism, reactionary anger, paranoia, unforeseen consequences. I made fun of it earlier when critics compared fans of the DC Cinematic Universe with the alt-right, but this really is a vibe that exists, which I find surprising. I mean, the DCEU started out with a very diverse team that really looks like what America looks like, which Marvel did not, the Avengers looking like they came out of some Scandinavian shithole. The DC movies also featured films led by women and by people of color in their initial lineup, which Marvel did not do for 10 years. But look at this awesome shot where it pans across Captain Marvel and all the second billings. Don't worry. She's got help.
Yay, feminism! I'm with her. You know, it's often pointed out by a certain type of self-hating individual who was once hurt very badly by a female that Wonder Woman really wasn't that great of a film, I'm paraphrasing somewhat to remove the racial slurs, and the truth is, yeah, it's maybe not as great as some of the praise would have you believe. In fact, in terms of feminist representation and social relevance, I would easily put Marvel's Jessica Jones ahead of Wonder Woman for its explorations of abuse and gaslighting and... You hired Sissy with my money to take you out. 50 bucks and a pack of smokes. Not to kill me. Then what? I'm pregnant. Still. They have a doctor on call here. Two months. That's as soon as the doctor can get to me. Every second it's there. I get raped. Again. Which isn't to say the praise Wonder Woman received wasn't genuine, far from it. I know a lot of people, women especially, to whom this movie meant a great deal, and Gal Gadot's interpretation of the character is something that's going to go down in pop culture history as iconic as Christopher Reeve's Superman or Mark Hamill's Joker. But I also think Wonder Woman got a bit of a boost in fan appreciation due to the extraordinarily low bar set for female superhero movies at that time. Green, straight up. I think it's a shame that Disney Marvel was making all these technically proficient movies for over a decade and never once thought to put a woman or a person of color in the lead role until the last year or two. Next time, baby. And while these are both, of course, the products of large, financially driven movie studios, the respective attitudes that the Snyderverse and the Disney Marvel movies have towards wealth and power are substantially different. In Man of Steel and Batman v Superman, everything is owned by one of two companies. Daily Planet. Wait, do I own this one? Or is that the other guy? Batman doesn't work with the cops. Bruce Wayne owns the cops. We have somebody at the prison? Oh, yeah. And of course Lex Luthor knows who Superman and Batman really are. He's a tech billionaire. Secrets aren't safe from someone like him. Contrast this with the Marvel movies, where it's not just okay that Tony Stark owns everything. It's fucking cool. I have successfully privatized world peace. And honestly, he's better at running things than our elected officials. Remember Civil War, where the conflict is whether superheroes should be tools of an inept government or have the authority to act unilaterally? We act by the consent of the governed, sir. Yes, dear. Batman v Superman begins with an American drone about to deliberately kill a member of the press in order to wipe out a group of militants she happens to be standing next to at the time. Superman drops out of the sky at the last instant, destroying the missile and the drone that carried it. This is a powerful, subversive use of the figure once billed as representing truth, justice, and the American way. Contrast this with the way we first see Iron Man in action, demolishing a group of similarly Araby militants from within the safety of a high-tech suit of armor. Technology. It's always been your Achilles heel in this part of the world. Sure, Tony Stark got wealthy selling arms, but he's into tech now. It's okay to give him ultimate power. He'll do the right thing with it. And interventionism isn't so bad when you think about it, so long as you're woke AF and you look rad when you do it. Look how awesome it is the way he bangs this naggy reporter, then has his robot butler and his surrogate mother throw her out. You are not authorized to access this area. Jesus. That's Jarvis. He runs the house. I've got your clothes here. They've been dry cleaned and pressed, and there's a car waiting for you outside that will take you anywhere you'd like to go. And check it out! His global surveillance system can also be like a cool prop in a teen adventure story. Peter, do you want me to cancel the drone strike on Brad Davis? Did you just punch Flash? No. Firing. <laughs> ha! Peter almost killed his classmate with a drone like an Iraqi parent's worst nightmare. Hilarious! Prometheus went with us, and he ruined Zeus's plan to destroy mankind, and for that he was given a thunderbolt. Two! That seems unfair. Eisenberg's Luther made a lot of people uncomfortable, and I kind of think he's supposed to. Lex is like the anti-Tony. Where Stark is cool, suave, witty, Lex is creepy, awkward, and drops bizarre, out-of-place historical anecdotes that he thinks are going to come off as profound, but just make everybody really uncomfortable. Scanning through old reviews in order to make this video, I noticed a lot of people had a very specific vision for what they wanted Lex Luthor to be, what they believed he should be. Let's take a look at Watchmen again. The violence in Watchmen, atypical 
spectacle of your standard superhero comic is ugly. It's a horror show, not a spectacle. It's like Moore's saying, this is the way we should feel about violence, and I think Eisenberg's portrayal is making a similar statement about the sort of people characters like Lex Luthor are based on. Luthor isn't supposed to be intimidating or badass. He's supposed to be dangerous, sure, but also pathetic and contemptible. It's like Snyder is saying, this is what real villains look like. Silicon Valley tech oligarchs and their relation to administrative government. It's cherry. The wealthy command so much influence that Amanda Waller comes to Bruce Wayne for protection after the events of Suicide Squad. People are asking questions about Midway City. The kind of people can get the answers, and if they can get those answers, my head will be on a pike. Consider yourself under my protection. His wealth and the power it brings make him every bit as terrifying and godlike to the average person as Superman. He's portrayed as a literal knight, a warrior aristocrat who dispenses his own brand of justice to the peasantry who live on his land. That's the judge. In my own tenuous understanding of early comic book history kind of way, I've always thought of the publication of Fantastic Four number one as the year the whole superhero thing hit puberty. Before the Marvel Renaissance, superhero comics were mostly made for very young children and tended not to stray from child-friendly themes. This was back in the old holy pie play Batman days where there was like this super quaint bat family that all slept in the same bed and the Justice League would all be best friends with each other at the end of the day. Then the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man and the Hulk came out, and things didn't feel as innocent as they were in the DC titles. Bruce Banner didn't like being the Hulk, and there was this undercurrent of, like, domestic abuse to his character. Life was always hard on Peter Parker, and sometimes he wasn't very sympathetic. The X-Men were outcasts, and Magneto, he was a terrorist, but also kind of sympathetic, right? Marvel, back in the day, had the reputation of being the subversive franchise, the one that wasn't afraid to talk about real issues, to show a world where things weren't always okay in the end, a world where we have to actually act to make things better. I remember a skulk of articles when Batman v Superman came out expressing concerns by parents over taking their kids to see a movie where Superman causes wide-scale urban destruction and Batman kills people. Oh, as an aside, I gotta say, Watchmen was like the Robocop of its generation in that it's this movie all these parents took young children to see because they thought it was some cute superhero flick and then it was all blue dicks and compound fractures. <laughs> Anyway, it does seem like the dynamic has switched a bit, doesn't it? Which isn't to say the Marvel flicks are devoid of adult themes. Winter Soldier, Black Panther, Guardians 2, all big boy films as far as I'm concerned. Nor is this to say the DC films, even the Schneider ones, are devoid of humor. That's another thing I found really over-exaggerated when Man of Steel first came out, how humorless everyone claimed it was. Honestly, I think every interaction between Perry White and Lois Lane is fucking hysterical. Flight to DC tonight, couple of days there. Go. Coach, no extra leg room. Economy plus. Coach! I love the scene where somebody on television insinuates that Lois knows who Superman is, and before he finishes speaking the sentence, Perry is already calling her. At the Daily Planet's Lois Lane knows who this guy is. And I think that she's the one that we should be questioning. The Marvel movies are a lot of fun. They're excellent escapism, and I can't wait to see what the next phase brings. What we're getting from Snyder isn't escapism. It's anti-escapism. Batman v Superman casts actual TV personalities and political commentators and has them talking about comic book shit like it's really happening. Every act is a political act. Is it really surprising that the most powerful man in the world should be a figure of controversy. It takes the fun, super-powered action spectacle we're used to getting in this type of movie and turns it into a horror show of the sort of all-too-real mass violence that's plagued the collective American subconscious for two decades. Which, now that I think of it, is actually a through-line transversing most of Snyder's material. Batman's opening monologue is an expression of the innocence lost feeling we have looking back on a pre-9-11 America. There was a time above. A time before. There were perfect things, diamond absolutes, the things fall, the things on earth, and what falls is fallen. The first time we see Batman in action, he's scurrying along the walls like some kind of creature. Next is in the nightmare, and then when he has what looks like a rifle over his shoulder. The message is clear. So falls the house of Wayne. I wasn't being facetious earlier when I compared this interpretation of Batman with Rorschach, that is to say, a satirization of a kind of right-wing American ideology, though not necessarily a comical one. It's a joke. It's all a joke. 
People exaggerate the degree to which Rorschach in particular is supposed to be a parody. Yes, he's a demented hobo who breaks into people's houses to eat beans and violently assaults those he perceives to be criminals, but he's really not supposed to be markedly less sympathetic than, like, the comedian Ozymandias Dr. Manhattan. What I think Snyder did with Rorschach is offer people a way out. Rorschach was done wrong by life. He's confused, and yes, it's made him into a violent lunatic, but he wants to be the good guy. He sees himself as doing the heroic thing. Why are so few of us left active, healthy, and without personality disorder? <laughs> Under the best of circumstances, Batman is really only a few shades from this already, if we're being honest. If an actual billionaire, or like an ex-cop or something, dressed up in a costume and started beating the shit out of criminals, we'd strap that motherfucker to a gurney like Hannibal Lecter. We're criminals, Alfred. We've always been criminals. Nothing's changed. What we're seeing here is Batman at his most fascistic, his most authoritarian, but also his most vulnerable. He stockpiles weapons and ammunition to kill an alien because of an attack that triggered memories of his own childhood trauma and feelings of helplessness. Things come to a head when Lex, aggressively coded like a Silicon Valley tech billionaire, artificially creates an ideological conflict to set Batman and Superman against each other. This is important. Their division is largely manufactured through manipulation of finances and the media. Lex plays off Bruce Wayne's PTSD and Survivor's Guild, uses KG Beast to vilify Superman, has branded prisoners assassinated. I tell you, it frustrates me to hear people accuse Snyder of not understanding the satirical nature of stories like Watchmen or The Dark Knight Returns, because while he's not necessarily satirizing the same things, there's clearly satire at play here. Look at Batman's face going into the Save Martha scene. Look how he throws the spear away. You know, it's true what they say about little boys. What I think Batman v Superman is satirizing... Born with no natural inclination to share. It's right there in the title. Anyone who's ever read a superhero comic knows this is a thing, right? Every single time a superhero has fought another superhero in comic books, since comic books have been invented, they fight and then they talk. A lot of people, for whatever reason, seem to make a pretty big deal out of the movie being called Batman v Superman instead of Batman vs Superman. But I actually don't think the V in the title is supposed to be short for the word versus. I think it's a feminine symbol. Remember this symbol on the Spartan shields, that kind of primitive phallus we talked about? Well, if you turn it upside down, the downward angle represents the antipode to the masculine, the womb, the yin, the passive principle of the universe, lunar energy and flowing water. If you make this symbol with your index and middle finger, it means peace. Actually, it was Winston Churchill who first used this hand sign in 1941 to signify V for victory. And look who's standing between Batman and Superman for the big hero shot, and look what's on her headband. The movie was never about a fight between Batman and Superman. That was always a red herring. It's about the big three coming together for the first time. It's not Batman versus Superman. It's Batman, Wonder Woman, Superman, Dawn of Justice. Get it? In addition to entirely missing the symbolism, I can't help but think getting hung up on the V in the title of Batman v Superman is kind of like getting hung up on the title in Sucker Punch or how homoerotic the Spartans were in 300. That is to say, you're kind of falling into the trap. I mean, really, their conflict could have been solved with, like, a conversation. Couldn't it? Right here, Superman totally could have explained the situation, but instead, look at the bitch you thought look he gives Batman before tackling him through a building and tossing him into the bat signal. This was about sending a message, a display of dominance. Stay down! If I wanted it! You be dead already! Batman v Superman is satirizing the whole screw attack, alpha dog, outskirts, thunderfuck, who would win in a fight, superhero smackdown thing. Just like fucking Watchmen did. Oh, and as long as we're talking about the not quite eight minute fight, there's another really stupid thing that a lot of people got hung up on, like the V in the title. We're supposed to assume he planned to get his ass kicked around the building for a lot of the fight in order to make sure it all ended up with Superman landing right near where he put the spear at the beginning. Oh look, Batman was totally able to lead the battle to this spot, even though that's goddamn impossible. It might be the stupidest thing in this movie, which is saying something. <laughs> Let me draw you a picture. This is where Batman left the spear, inside the building with the bat signal on the roof. He waited for Superman, 
next to the building with the spear inside of it. Superman tossed him onto the roof of that building, Batman gassed him and kicked him through a skylight, then he gassed him again and threw him down some stairs and dragged him to where the spear is. Everything he did was to move Superman closer to the spear, literally exactly what he does with Doomsday later in the movie. It's really not that convoluted. Which is kind of the point, the fight was never meant to be the big superhero showdown everybody wanted, it's poking fun at the very concept. You know, it's true what they say about little boys, born with no natural inclination to share. Batman and Superman have these massive cleft chins that are accentuated with the same shadow makeup that made the Spartans' abs pop in 300. And yes, the fight ends when we see the big bad Batman was just a little boy trying to compensate for a childhood trauma he never recovered from. That's solved, Batman takes just enough time to change out of his fuck-around pants before giving us what unquestionably has to be the best action sequence ever filmed with a character. Don't you think Zack Snyder, of all people, could have made the fight with Superman look this cool if he wanted to? Because if you haven't heard, he's really good with visuals. As much as everyone hates it, I even like the jar of piss thing. First, it's supposed to be weird. It's like the movie is saying leaving a jar of piss on someone's desk is the kind of thing a tech geek would do because he thinks it shows dominance. There's this tension in the room. Holly Hunter knows something is about to happen. Tess looks behind her and knows something is wrong with Lex not being there. You can tell something terrible is about to go down. There's this moment, small but it was there, and then... <laughs> Batman v Superman is a movie that examines the concept of unforeseen consequences. We saved the farm. Your grandma baked me cake. Said I was a hero. Later that day we found out. We blocked the water all right, we sent it upstream. The whole Lang farm washed away. It opens on the big action climax from Man of Steel, as seen from the ground, by the people being crushed under the rubble from Zod and Superman's battle. When the American military tries to nuke Doomsday, they knock Superman unconscious when he was about to throw the monster into space. Only kryptonite weapons can kill us. They might, if you had any left. I understand why these movies were disliked. They made people uncomfortable. They made me uncomfortable. They were meant to make us uncomfortable. Unfortunately, they also made the studio uncomfortable. Batman v Superman, as much as I like it, was clearly messed with. I understand. Like, I strongly feel Batman said something else here before Superman shoves him that was hastily cut. A lot of people have pointed out how out of place the Justice League teaser email felt, and whoever was responsible for spoiling Doomsday and Wonder Woman in the promotional material should be severely punished. I've heard the entire marketing team was fired, and that's a good start, but do we really want to allow people like that to continue breathing free air? Food for thought. Snyder stepped down after initial photography wrapped on the sequel to deal with the family tragedy ahead of sweeping studio mandated reshoots. There's been a good deal of speculation over whether Snyder left willingly or the studio forced him out and whether he really had a say in who his replacement was, but the truth is nobody really knows what happened unless they were personally involved in some way with the project. We all know the rest. Joss Whedon was brought in to make everything more fun and added things like the Amazonian door closer women in metal bikinis and the red sky and the hysterical scene where Flash trips and face plants and Wonder Woman's boobs. Yay! Feminism. And I love that Batman picks up a Boston accent by the end because Ben Affleck just stopped trying. We buy him some time, he can stop that box from destroying all life on Earth. I just think so much about the way these movies were received by critics is such a shame. The way they were misunderstood and misrepresented, the way they were messed with by the studio and had major reveals and surprises spoiled in the promotional material, the way Disney moved the release date of Civil War essentially just to turn up the dial on this clicky DC versus Marvel bullshit, the way Suicide Squad got the same treatment as Justice League, chopping it to bits, removing Steppenwolf, turning the Enchantress into a Mayan stripper goddess who spends the second half of the film gyrating in a bikini. I think it's a shame especially that Snyder's plans for the future Justice League sequels were derailed because the ideas they had seem really interesting and I'd like to have been able to see how they all played out. If nothing else, I'd love to at least see the original version for Snyder's Justice League completed. By all accounts, there's something like an hour and a half of footage that was cut and a good deal more reworked by 
Whedon. Alas, this may not be practical, and I know so because I've seen dozens of Hollywood insiders right here on YouTube explain into their blue yetis how and why getting a Zack Snyder cut of Justice League is simply impossible. But apparently nobody told fans of Zack Snyder in the DCEU because they've toxically raised over $100,000 for suicide prevention in order to bring attention to their cause, the fascists. No, it's happening! The prophets have lied! Snyder has ascended! God is dead! The tower is falling! Ah! I actually think it's pretty cool that there's an organized effort to raise awareness of the film and keep the studio informed of the fans' desire to see it. The movement to release the Snyder Cut has received a good deal of criticism from online media outlets and film journalists. A very long blog article posted to Medium, which begins with a super classy move of attacking a Chinese woman's English, questions whether releasing the Snyder Cut would be rewarding bad behavior. The article goes on to call fans of the DCEU far and away the angriest and most virulent community on the internet, comparing the Schneider Cut movement to Gamergate, calling them a cult, and citing these very obvious joke images as proof of how crazy they all are. Of course, all this is easily debunked hyperbolic nonsense. Yes, it's very easy to debunk that this is not a real picture of Zack Schneider. Good job. An article from Vox claims the Snyder cult subsists on an us-versus-them mentality and raises grave concerns over such fans getting what they want. Well, the ship may have sailed on that one, and according to this article, that pretty much heralds the end times for internet discourse as we know it. So it was fun while it lasted, everyone. Remember, kids, be gay, do crime. They bullied those who thought the theatrical released version of the film was good, but more than anything else, they bullied Warner Brothers, who clearly went in a completely different direction than what Snyder was planning. The defensiveness, paranoia, jealousy, insecurity, hostility, and entitlement of the worst subsections of Snyder fandom has allowed their simple passion for superhero cinema to metastasize into a cancer which threatens to spread and engulf all online spaces. Instead of leading to change, the increasing number of fan petitions is merely exacerbating the culture of toxic fandom. Schneider's fans have prowled social media, proselytizing and harassing Warner Brothers into acquiescing to their demands. It cannot be overestimated how the release the Schneider Cut faction have contributed to the level of toxicity in genre fandom today. And you'd best believe that if the Snyder Cut were released the very next day, the rallying cry on the internet would change to let Snyder make Justice League 2. Even if the film is released, there's little evidence to show their cycle of vitriol and entitled behavior would come to an end. In fact, it could embolden them to make even more demands, such as the release of David Ayer's edit of 2016 Suicide Squad, the return of Ben Affleck to the Batcave to star in and direct his discarded screenplay, and perhaps even the full reinstatement of Zack Snyder to finish his planned five-film narrative. This is where we hold them! The fact that Warner Brothers has not only acknowledged this incredibly obnoxious fan uproar, but also agreed to, per their demands, release the Snyder Cut is mystifying, if not dangerous. These Snyder fans are the ISIS of the DC fandom. <laughs> A lot of these articles that paint such vivid pictures of a vitriolic fan mob demanding their movie the way they want it, I notice, fail to mention exactly why the original cut was changed in the first place. Because it's not like Batman v Superman was received with anything like toxicity or entitlement by comic book fans. Imagine claiming that a group subsists off an us versus them mentality in the same breath that you refer to them as a cult. I find the Gamergate comparison in particular to be rather galling. Who's personal information has been hacked and made public over the Snyder Cut? How many speaking events have had to be closed down because of literal fucking terrorist threats? How many people have had their relatives and family members harassed and stalked? Have any of these directors been forced to flee their homes and go into hiding because of thousands of online stalkers? Fucking no, they haven't. And while a few angry boy men made rather lucrative cyber stalking careers off of Gamergate, I don't recall a lot of that money going to charity. And I don't mean to diminish online harassment, I've been harassed before 
before, and even doxxed twice on previous accounts, once by a vindictive ex and once by what most people would probably consider a hate site. And the latter in particular was a fucking awful experience I can only describe as turning over a rock and seeing your own face underneath. And people who do that kind of thing, especially over nerd shit, are just the worst kinds of imp- and yeah, some people on Twitter and other social media platforms have conducted themselves in a manner I would consider to be inappropriate over this movie. While I think it can be useful to apply pressure to studio executives and corporate entities, harassing Matt Reeves or Joss Whedon or Patty Jenkins is totally unacceptable and completely counterintuitive to what you actually want to accomplish. Doing this kind of shit is absolutely no better than all those fucking idiots who said Man of Steel ruined their childhoods because they wanted Christopher Reeve come again and got something else. That being said, heads of large movie studios and famous millionaire film directors are probably in a position where they have to moderate their social media anyway, and as far as I'm aware, nobody's accused them of being fascists or threatened to bomb their speaking engagements, so, you know, little perspective. And in my experience, this sort of behavior really isn't at all indicative of the movement to release the Snyder Cut. Most of the people involved, I've found, just really enjoy Zack Snyder's films, and having quite correctly seen the theatrical release of Justice League as the half-formed grotesquery that it was, would like to see the version that the director and hundreds of other talented, hardworking people put years into making. And say what you will about overzealous fans, their ultimate goal is to bring about a positive, isn't it? They want the movie finished and made available. Call that misguided, ignorant, maybe entitled if you are feeling particularly uncharitable. I disagree, but I could see how you'd come to that point. But toxic discourse, in my experience, is cyclical. That is to say, it flows in both directions. Were I to identify toxic behavior in this whole mess, I would point, perhaps, to the folks comparing the movies we've seen with Nazi propaganda or making four-hour fan documentaries about how terrible Batman v Superman is. Maybe the article panning Watchmen over a decade after the film was released or the performative fan fiction about retconning the Snyder movies that have come out and how funny it would be if this upset the fans of these movies. CW's crisis might be planning to make good on the worlds will live, worlds will die part of this whole concept, and wouldn't it be something if they were to just randomly drop the identifying clips from Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, and Justice League into the universe? that ceased to be montage and the movies just plowed ahead after that would definitely be an interesting precedent and as much as you know it'd make a lot of people pretty upset I think it'd be pretty damn funny myself <laughs> Look, I'm not picking on Movie Bob or his opportunistic takedown of Batman v Superman or his something like eight videos now all insisting Joker isn't really about anything. If I had been making videos when Batman v Superman first came out, I probably would have been suckling at that same teat right alongside all the other fucking baby critics. But why was there such a lucrative market for this kind of content in the first place? I remember there being a lot of videos and articles back in late 2017, early 2018 reporting on a Disney conspiracy to buy off critics and film reviewers to up the ratings of the Marvel movies. Or I guess I should say reporting on the belief in such a conspiracy, since most of these pieces were essentially just a collection of screen capped tweets with the author providing commentary and backstory. I personally found most of these to be exaggerations or mischaracterizations of some very convoluted arguments people were having on social media. I don't know how many people were actually convinced there was a literal conspiracy in the vein of Disney paying off critics for positive reviews. but film Film criticism and entertainment reporting aren't necessarily fields that reward diversity of opinions, and when every outlet and reviewer is essentially parroting the same thing from all directions, combined with the shady stuff that Disney or any other large corporation does to undermine its competition, it can often seem like a conspiracy. But even in the tweets cited by a lot of these articles, the accusations of being paid off are made to highlight what the person perceives to be critical hypocrisy, or they're even tagging it conspiracy theory, like clearly making a joke and it's being reported as people actually believing there's a legit conspiracy. I hope it goes without saying, I do not think there is any kind of organized conspiracy to discredit Zack Snyder or any of the DCEU films. But I also think there's kind of a market for dunking on them right now, and I think it's one that a lot of bloggers and journalists cashed in on hard between 2015 and 2018. So, if we're gonna be making Gamergate comparisons... The nature of Zack Snyder's work is such that it almost defies mainstream acceptance. And as those words come out of my mouth, I'm very aware of how pretentious they sound. And, and you know, I'm not that guy. I swear, I've never set foot in a film school in my life, and if I had my way, the word auteur would be launched into the fucking sun. But I also do feel like Zack Snyder is one of those artists, and there are a few in every generation, whose work is widely misunderstood by critics in its own time. What I find so disappointing about Snyder's most dedicated fans 
Guardians, the ones continuously advocating for the director's cut of Justice League to be finished and made available being mischaracterized as a cult or as toxic, is that aside from, in my experience, this being the absolute farthest thing from the truth, they really are doing something very valuable in organizing fans and spreading awareness about the film and about Snyder's work in general. To say nothing of the now hundreds of thousands of dollars raised for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and other charitable causes. I wrote and recorded most of this essay before the latest updates dropped, but I did want to ass a brief ass. I wrote and recorded most of this essay before the latest updates dropped, but I did want to add a brief segment congratulating and indeed thanking everybody in the community who's come together to help facilitate this. Not in the least because of the sheer volume of negative publicity that the movement and for some still inexplicable reason Snyder himself have gotten over the past few years. And I get it, who wants to read about artist rights and six figures and charitable donations when you can be scrolling through the umpteenth article in a row about the toxic people who are bad and the bad things they do. A lot has been written and recorded about the Snyder Cut movement over the past few years, but most of the ink, pixels, whatever, have been about the assholes. And that too is a shame, because there are a lot of really awesome content creators out there who haven't gotten nearly enough positive attention because the spotlight is always on a handful of other people's abusive tweets. Fiona Zhang is one of the founders and most prolific organizers in the movement, as well as the creator of ForSnyderCut.com, probably the most valuable and supportive resource I've been able to find for cataloging, organizing, and archiving information related to Zack Snyder and the director's cut of Justice League. Chris Wong's a huge fan of the DCEU who posts almost daily updates and discusses news as it comes out on his podcast, Ping Pong Flicks, right here on YouTube. Kaya Sengupta runs a blog called Nerd with Words where she writes about Snyder's movies and the DCEU films as well as a plethora of other topics. All of these people, as well as many others in the community, are well worth checking out and I'll be linking their stuff in the description. Zack Snyder has had an audacious career, to say the least his superhero universe is essentially a deconstruction of everything that fans have been trained to expect from the genre. I very much see how his work would have a strong but niche appeal and develop what you could call a cult following while also not necessarily being everyone's cup of tea. But that alone doesn't explain why the discourse surrounding his work has always been so contentious, and if you've noticed the music is starting to pick up, it's because we're entering another montage. Even though I don't doubt that the yet-to-be-named Batman vs Superman project has the potential to be compelling, it will never be able to outgrow Zack Snyder's adolescent view of superheroes, which clearly exists just so Snyder can make racist, sexist, reductive films about them. You are despicable. You are ruining movies. Batman v Superman ruined these characters for a generation. Zack Snyder, you are 45 years old and you're making movies for 15 year olds. When Stanley Kubrick was your age, he had made 2001. Zack's icky response interview was something we should have expected. But that doesn't mean we have to take Snyderism sitting down. Master of right-wing propaganda? When Steven Spielberg was your age, he was prepping Schindler's List. When David Lean was your age, he had made Brief Encounter. Get a life! The return to homoeroticism in his recent comic book efforts are arguably due to Grindr. <laughs> <laughs> what? Are arguably due to Grindr proving that many 20-year-old boys don't exactly find the idea of a giant god king who wants to have his way with you particularly scary. Snyder's tone-deaf attitude to the content of his films, prioritizing visuals above narrative, makes them frequently problematic, often hurtful odes that very rarely don't resemble Aryan propaganda. Snyder manages to demonstrate both his undoubted strengths as a visual artist as well as his obvious shortcomings as a profoundly flawed storyteller. This not only makes him selfish, it makes him pretty stupid as well. You're so fucking stupid! You're so fucking stupid! In retrospect, it was inevitable. It's like Brexit or Donald Trump's clinching of the presidency. First you hear that it happened, then even if you wanted it to happen, you're shocked. And they've heard it. Out in the dark, among the stars. <laughs> I've probably gone on long enough at this point about why I like these movies. I guess the question I'll close on is for those who hate them. Get a life! Stop <laughs> inflicting your stupid movies on me! I hate my job because of you, you ass! Why? 
Why all the negativity? There have been dozens of interpretations of these characters. Why did these movies cause such a visceral, such a personal reaction in so many people? Why do so many want them to simply not be? I can't answer that because I don't know. Maybe you don't either. What I do know is that Zack Snyder makes very inclusive movies with multi-ethnic casts and people call him a fascist. Almost every one of his films contains a critique of capitalism and he's called an objectivist. And for all that people praise his talent with visuals, I find that very few actually make any kind of an effort to really look at what those visuals are saying. I'm not saying he's a genius. I'm not qualified to determine whether someone is a genius or not. But none of the things I've described in this essay require a genius to create, and I only even bring this up because that's always the ridiculous straw man people turn to, that because I compliment Snyder's work or put the slightest degree Degree of thought into reading it, I must be in a cult and think he's a genius, and Rorschach, and look at this picture someone edited of him as a messianic figure. You see, it's a cult. Maybe he's a genius, maybe he's an idiot. Maybe he's just an oddity of nature, that right confluence of quirks and fetishes that sometimes makes for really interesting art. Maybe it doesn't matter, and what we perceive as intellectual disparities between human beings, artists in particular, are really just differences in perspective and life experience. I like Zack Snyder, or rather I should say I like his movies. I like them quite a bit, and while art of any kind is of course subjective, I do think the majority of professional critics, as well as the self-styled forum critics who parrot their opinions for social media cred, could stand to look a little more closely at his work. I did, and I found a lot more to it than I expected. Also, he definitely thinks Jesus was an alien and the government had a hand in 9-11. <laughs> Thank you for watching, especially if you've stuck with me all the way to the end. And Zachary, if you somehow see this, I apologize for all the times I've pronounced your name Schneider. I swear I re-recorded the audio for this like three times, but I know a bunch still got through. Normally this is the part of the video where I plug my Patreon, but in keeping with the spirit of the movement that's come to surround Zack Snyder's Justice League, I would instead encourage anyone who's enjoyed this video or any of the films discussed therein to make a donation to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Their website is is on your screen right now and I'll be including a link in the description to this video. In addition to the usual names, I also want to thank Gremlin, Athena Reddy, Rebecca B Kaya Sengupta, and Mia Mulder for lending their superb vocal talents to this video, as well as Hilbert of History with Hilbert for letting me use his animation, and Elio Garcia for helping me track down that panel from Frank Miller's 300, and whom I forgive for his crimes against me. And pointedly not Film Gob. Oh. That's right. You were warned, motherfucker! Finally, I'd like to thank my patrons for their help in funding this channel and allowing me to buy things like the new monitor I used to edit this video. Ooh. Ah. Okay, no, that was all me. But you did buy me a big old Costco-sized bag of coffee beans, which, while not as overtly sexy as the monitor, was still every bit as integral in the production of this video. So thank you once again for your support and for the precious beans. beans which have kept me going in these crazy times. Daniel K, Minesweeper501, and Ill Caesar. It's been a fun first year, everyone. I'll see you again real soon. Why be a king when you can be a god? Okay, so Alan Moore's Watchmen makes reference to Edward Blake having been in Dallas at the time of John F. Kennedy's assassination. Given that the comedian had been working for the government at the time, this was likely Moore's nod to the theories that government agents, specifically factions within the CIA, had a hand in the Kennedy assassinations. This is as far as the comic takes it, but Snyder's version actually shows this happening in the opening montage. Then the comedian's funeral opens to Simon and Garfunkel's The Sounds of Silence, a song that many believe was inspired by the assassination of John F. Kennedy. The camera slowly starts to pan out, and right as the cemetery gates come into view, And the vision that was planted in my brain still remains. I mean, I'm not seeing things, right? Looks like I get the last word. Suck it, bitches. <laughs>